Chaos Knights. Open your heart to hatred. Open your mind to fury. Open your soul to the Dark Ones. Let not your forebears stand between you and the power that is offered. The sun has set on the age of chivalry, and the night that is to come belongs to those with the strength to assert their rule. Canticle of the Warped Becoming From the Liber Idolater Chaos Knights Horus was weak. I step out of the circles as they dim, their power spent, my will enacted, my purpose achieved. In my hand I hold a weapon, a blade wrought of a thousand thousand spines, drenched in the fires of Korn's own realm, quenched in the blood of the innocent, rivers of it. Yet it was only truly forged today, with this last crowning act. It is now prison as much as creation, for within this blade I have bound a rare being indeed, Delacour. A demon of corn, of course, but one not of this realm, nor truly of the warp. Here at least, a traveller, a rarity. His presence will help, the conundrum of his existence lending weight to my true purpose. But I need throw the dice again, scry as I might, all is so blurred there. I require a delivery system, a guardian of this fetish. So whom shall I give this mighty tool? A question for another time, when the board is set. Speaking thereof, my time grows short. I must collect the last of the forces my master has ordered mustard. Let us recap. Ah, the times have been good. Tarax Antarax, Lord of Iron. He brings his army, for they are still that his iron warriors, more than most. But he also brings his mighty machines, his allies of the dark and broken cog, and a relentless march. Excellent. Amanthus Envoros. He wields the shadows like a blade. His terror troops will be of high use. His presence will tip the scales and the horrors that will occur under those moons in the night. Their name, the Night Lords, will be sorely tested. Send their ace. Indeed we shall. The Alpha Legion have deigned to assist us on this venture or so. But then, from my services over the ages, they did truly owe me one. More than. But this one will do to be going on with. They already sit amongst our victims' councils, cooking their food, washing their sheets, carrying their messages, rubbing their feet. Oh, how pandemonium will reign when we raise the banners. So close now. Zamet Haket and his sorceries stand with us also. Me again, of course. I know things they wish to know. This is a thousand sons' price. Hence they are invested. They gain their thirty silver scrolls of knowledge. The second we win. So they need to ensure that we do. And that I survive especially. <laughs> Sarvak the Butcher 
and his walking wounded are aboard. Brains minced over millennia. It is a wonder any are still alive. The original world eaters. Yet, here he is. One of the most gifted. One of the originals. One of the best. And all of his many, many defilers and cohorts of berserkers. We will hurl them at whatever we need to die the most, and they will certainly die. My own word-bearers are gathered, prepared. They will crush the enemy with their numbers, will annihilate them with the hordes they summon, and the ardor of our feats at arms. I am amply represented. My power not merely personal, I earned my seat at the table, my place at his left hand. My master brings his own forces, mightiest of all in number, equipment, blessings, and ships. His forces will blot out the skies, quite literally. For when he releases the swarms, well, it will be entertaining to hear the wailing. I look forward to that. Two more need to be gained, for completion's sake. But not of the black, but of the green. A representative of the old 16th, not Abaddon's chimerical lot. A true son of his sire, so to put it. Few remain, but they are there, and I must have them. And of course, we simply cannot move without one born to the purple. The favored of Steinesh, their abilities, their chaotic effect, they must be garnered. But I will move on that once I have concluded my affairs here. For we have many. But a full sweep is always a heartwarming spectacle. And not just Marines. But oh, so much more I have gathered. The Cardinal will be important in this one, I have no doubt. My investment returned. When I play that card, it needs to be to maximum effect. The men and women who have already had their colors changed by him. Useful indeed. So many pieces arranged, but not all. Not my body, of course, my sentience, my soul, for I must summon one who I own, utterly. Yet to do so, I must contact him. Ah, how I remember those days when we first fought alongside each other. His knightly house attached to we word bearers. Of course, we were haughty. They were brave, though. I respect that, you see, very much. Courage. For as we fought in the streets, hab block to hab block, there they were, stalking the largest thoroughfares, cunning and quick. They took enemy armor apart in detail, always. And when we faced Xenos races, they were often engaged as bitterly as we were. The macrocosm of the microcosm for they faced beings as large as themselves with every bit the iron we did. And they, like we, were the most loyal of all in the crusade. <laughs> the most emphatic, the most zealous, in different ways, but with no less purpose, no less guts, no less drive. They were warriors. Only they and the princeps did we truly respect. Then things changed. And the knights were thrown into disarray. The conundrum. <laughs> their ancient ways of honor were as rigid as the armor of their steeds. Inflexible. They swore fealty to the Imperium. But they had sworn it via us. They had sworn to Lorgar the Aurelian, our Primarch, 
to the word bearers. And thus, they chose to break faith with those that they had fought beside, bled with, or to see their oath as being issued to a distant figure at the center of the Imperium, a mythical god in gold. One we proved was a liar. So the choice for them was simple, yet the ramifications. The first years were hard on them, very. And as we all changed the blood, the lust, the disease, the mutations, not only of form, but of function and thought, of essence, it altered us all. It brought out the truth. I became a powerful sorcerer, my mind freed, as was my lord's. But they, the knights, they were shorn of their excuses and pretenses, and we saw them for what they were. Take away the pomp and snapped uniforms, hauteur and honor. Well, you were left with gallants. <laughs> no, deeper than that. They are people pleasers. And when we ordered them to murder, they did. And the turmoil stripped away everything. And soon they were our dogs. We pointed, they destroyed. And each atrocity threw them further down the hole. To atone, they obeyed. But that created more guilt, so even more obsequiousness. It was only to us, we marines, of course. Any normal baseline humans were treated as we did, like gnats or pigs, to be farmed and used. The knights fought with us in the heresy, through the scramble away from the avenging loyalists, and all throughout the later years the later wars between the legions and the Eye of Terror. Now, I activate them again. I summon them to my side. I sit, and I walk the paths, separating myself from my mortal vehicle, my body. I know his dreams. I have visited them so often over the years. And he is in a perpetual state of waking nightmare. I follow his despair and misery, despite how he cloaks it in arrogance and self-import. And there he is. I flow through the warp, allowing my consciousness to merge with his. I look through his eyes. I can see what he sees, smell what he smells, feel he feels. I involuntarily shudder at the pure exaltation of the depth of his nuanced existence. He is stuck inside his night, a walking tomb as much as any hell brute or dreadnought. He is trapped. It will never look for a doorway or aperture to escape his incarceration. He is mine, and so are all below him an entire house of the finest warriors, all mine. I look through his eyes, he leads them. In his mighty walker of power and purpose, he walks out, revealing himself as the column of Imperial Guard tanks and transports trundles along. They see him, they react by slowing, then immediately firing. The mortal crews are surprisingly awake this day, but their volleys of battle cannon fire do naught to his demi-titan, his knight. The iron shields flare, explosions rippling along their exterior. Like a magical egg of protection, he sits in plain sight, goading them. They advance, of course. This is not bravery. This is ignorance and arrogance. Monkey see, monkey do. So the monkeys move into their standard patterns. We know them. We know them all. 
My swell knows what will happen now as well. He did before he even revealed himself. A cadre of Lancer knights now appear to the column's rear, or are smaller than the one at the head, of course. He has the most powerful of all of the suits there. He is their leader. Yet, they are knights. Their lances fire into the column and melt transports as if they were ants beneath a lens. When they get into the back ranks, they tear them apart. Confusion reigns. The front of the column attempts to eat the distance between themselves and my slave. They have the vain hope that range was the issue. <laughs> that their weapons could not punch through his protection unless they were closer. Foolish. It makes little difference. Not to him. I have pulled him more than one favor to make his armaments the best that can be gained. He walks forward ignoring their feeble attempts to even scratch his suit. And the war dogs arise from the flanks. Smaller harbingers of dread. They are larger than a dreadnought, smaller than a knight. But the packs of them fall on the transports and tanks on the sides. They carve into them with huge chained weapons, melting them with close-range fire. They stomp and stab and throw the men and women who fall out of the transports in a vain attempt to escape the slaughter. My thrall steps forward, stamping on hundreds of them as he goes. His firepower kills all that is not destroyed by the others. It is over within three minutes. They are all dead. A full regiment of guard and armor this. This is what we need for the crusade. Of course, we need the titans my master has secured. But knights? Oh, how I adore knights. Not just for the titillation of their misery, but their strategic and tactical use. I do so look forward to deploying them when we get there. When we raise our banners when the crusade is finally called and we head to Abundance Tertius. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the forces, factions, and units of the Warhammer 40k universe, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. And today, we shall be asking ourselves one fundamentally important question. But before we do, please know that we have started a new channel, GK Natural History. Very relaxing and a bit of fun. So please check the links in the description. Now, on to that important question. What is a Chaos Knight? The Knight of the Realm twisted, desecrated, warped. Once, these were some of the brightest lights of humanity, the bravest, the truest, the most unquestionable in their loyalty. The knights are not just the vehicles, the war machines they ride, they are the pilot as well. They are technological tools from a bygone age of manifest enlightenment, the age of technology. Like Aspect Warrior or Phoenix Lord Armor of the Eldar, the Mighty Walker is also a tomb, a place where ghosts of the past are ever present. Their honor is absolute, their valor second to none. They know fear, unlike the Astartes, but they discipline themselves so rigidly, courage hardwired into their very beings, that they never succumb to it, ever. To be a pilot of a knight is to be as rare as the princeps of the Collegia Titanica, truly one of humanity's best and brightest. The ones able to struggle with the will, the machine spirit of the gargantuan metallic knight, a weapon of incredible potency. Able to rake battle tanks away with firepower or destroy entire regiments in close quarters in a matter of mere moments. There's a titan-grade arms, and few things are proof from their power. 
They are some of humanity's most skilled and powerful warriors. They are brave and true. They are knights. Yet imagine, just for an instant, the depths one could go, the horrors one of these humans clad in the shell of a demi-titan could do. What terrible methods one would need to break a knight of the realm and turn them to evil. And so, gentle listener, we shall now hear what the brightest blades of the human race devolve into when they bow to the forces of chaos. Let us learn of Chaos Knights. And so, as usual, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote. Warriors of the Traitor Houses. Chaos Knights tower over the battlefield, each a god of war wrought in iron, piloted by nobles who have forsworn their allegiances to the Imperium. These bipedal engines of destruction are amongst the most fearsome creations in the galaxy. The roar of tortured engines and warp-infused macro servos precedes the coming of the Chaos Knights. With vast strides, the gargantuan machines draw ever closer to their quarry, their trudging footfalls sending quakes through the shattered earth. Long shadows extend before them, shrouding their enemies in darkness, while suffocating plumes of plasmic exhaust pour down from warlike vents. Those marked for death by the knights are gripped by the inescapable truth that their doom approaches, and as they open fire upon the towering machines, the last of their hope evaporates. Flickering ion shields absorb the incoming fire, energy blasts dissipating and artillery shells exploding harmlessly before they can strike their targets. Undaunted, the knights continue their ominous march. Their bristling weapon systems grind into firing positions, and with thunderous cracks, they unleash annihilation upon the foe. Enormous melter weapons shoot beams of searing heat that erupt into fiery novas, immolating infantry and reducing armored vehicles to bubbling slag. Monstrous battle cannons rain hails of explosive shells upon the foe, detonating with enough force to crack open a ferrocrete bunker. Rockets and missiles streak through the skies towards the most threatening opponents, annihilating these priority targets with punishing swiftness. Those enemies not instantly obliterated by the opening barrages are cut down by blinding bursts of laser weaponry or atomized by the knight's plasma-fueled armaments. As the survivors desperately seek to hold the line, the knights fire streams of solid shot that tear through flesh and armor, leaving only shredded corpses and a thick crimson mist where soldiers once rallied. Those who do not flee as the titanic machines approach are blasted apart at close range immolated by jets of burning promethium or simply ground to pulp beneath slab-like feet. Looming over their enemies, the knights swing their colossal chainswords in reaping arcs. Jagged adamantine teeth soar through tank hulls with contemptuous ease and liquefy the hapless crews inside. Other knights use thunderstrike gauntlets to pulverize their foes crushing war machines to scrap within their obliterating grip, or using the energy-wreathed fists like wrecking balls to batter aside all resistance. Each Chaos Knight is an unholy relic of humanity's ancient past. They are twisted reflections of the Imperial Knights, corrupted in form and spirit by fell sorceries, dark worship and malefic re-engineering. The knight suits were first created using standard template constructs during the Dark Age of Technology, and many have survived through the innumerable wars that have characterized the long millennia since. For generations uncounted, the colossal war machines have been piloted by nobles, aristocratic warriors possessed of enough physical, mental, and spiritual fortitude to survive the ritual of becoming commune with the throne mechanicum 
at each construct's heart and thus bond with their knight's suit. In the case of Chaos Knights, such rituals are tainted by warp entities, malefic sorceries, and the perversions of the nobles themselves. At first, the knights may appear unchanged, but in its core, the irrevocable process of rot has already begun. Over years or even centuries, chaos energy seep into the war engine, torturing its machine spirit and mutating its mechanical form. Where once the suit and its pilot were a gleaming beacon of imperial honor, the Chaos Knight and its fallen noble comprise a symbiotic beast of unfettered wrath and base hatred. A noble is enabled to pilot their war machine by being wired into an arcane contraption that is implanted into their knight's cockpit, a thrown mechanicum in the larger knights, or a helm mechanicum in the smaller classes. Neural jacks and cerebral uplinks connect the pilot's nervous system to the device, allowing them to directly interface with the machinery of their steed. Actuators and omnimotivators are driven by streams of hateful thoughts, while sensory information and multispectral auspex relays feed back into the noble's mind with burning clarity. Within each throne mechanicum are the spectral echoes of its previous pilots, screaming techno-geists whose suffering increases exponentially as the night to which they are bonded grows ever more warped. Only the most indomitable fallen nobles are able to commune with a throne mechanicum. Those that do are able to spur their Chaos Knight into action by inimical will alone. Nobles who are wired into a Helm Mechanicum are similarly twisted by Chaos Energies that have been absorbed by their war engine. The Helms also yoke these pilots' mind and soul to the will of their knightly overlords. Since the Horus Heresy, thousands of individual knights and even whole knight households have fallen to Chaos. Each instance of treachery is a monumental blow to the Imperium. The nobles and their knight suits are not only crucial cogs in humanity's war machine, they are considered to be amongst the most unshakably loyal servants of the Emperor. The mere suggestion that a noble could forswear their vows and fight against the Imperium servants is a tantamount to blasphemy. It is whispered that the Departmento Munitorum has had Imperial officers executed for heresy, rather than acknowledge their claims that they have done battle with turncoat nobles. Yet the terrifying reality is the Chaos Knights, bent on anarchy and slaughter, march upon the Emperor's realm in ever-increasing numbers. Fallen nobles embark on campaigns of destruction for many reasons. Some do so to conquer territory in the name of the baleful deities they worship. Others have sworn fealty to the Dark Mechanicum, the heretic Astartes or powerful demonic entities, and answer the dread summons of war whenever they are called upon. Others still are driven by insanity and profane visions, launching quests to upend the very fabric of existence and transform the galaxy into a twisted hellscape. Chaos Knights are able to cover enormous distances when battling across a planet, marching unhindered through toxic atmospheres and across irradiated continents to reach their enemies. When their wars stretch beyond a single world, many of their kind use corrupted exploratory craft and mass conveyance barges to transport themselves to the front lines. On the most warp-drenched battlefields, the horrific war engines have even been known to storm forth from empiric tears in reality. A single Chaos Knight has as much resilience and firepower as a small army. Those that have turned upon or even butchered the rest of their knightly household are termed Dreadblades by the Ordo Hereticus. They typically operate as lone wolves and mercenaries, lending their immense might to heretical warlords in exchange for powerful relics arcane knowledge, or fief planets upon which they can enact their cruelties. Dread blades are often followed into battle by hordes of warriors, chaos space marines who revere the knight's destructive potential 
and throngs of cultists who worship the machines as manifestations of the Dark God's will. At other times, multiple dread blades will gather together, focusing their disparate fury towards a single malefic purpose. But even more terrifying than the individualistic dread blades, but even more terrifying than the individual dread blades, are the night houses that have fallen in their entirety to chaos. Those that have sided with traitor titan legions and the Dark Mechanicum are known as infernal houses and use techno sorcery and summoned demonic entities to bolster the already formidable capabilities of their knight suits. Other knightly courts, known as iconoclast houses, have more varied heretical allegiances. Some have maintained oaths of fealty to heretic Astartes legions or the dark gods themselves, whereas others have renounced their allegiance to the Imperium to carve out their own dread empires. A Legacy of Betrayal The history of the Chaos Knights stretches back into the dark recesses of humanity's past. Long before the Emperor rose on terror and forged the Imperium of Man, the Knights had established their bastions on worlds across the galaxy. Through countless horrors and long millennia they endured, but even they were not immune to the corruptions of the Warp. The first night houses were established shortly after humanity began expanding its domain into the stars. Groups of colonists struck out from Terra aboard long march ships, traveling for decades or even centuries through the cold void of space to reach their destination worlds. Countless colonists were lost to empiric disasters and navigational errors, while those who arrived successfully upon their new planets were faced with all manner of extreme hardships. Some worlds were battered by savage electrical storms or burned with unrelenting volcanic activity. Others were bathed in exotic radiation, covered in carnivorous flora, or infested with strange pathogens that decimated the new arrivals. Many plants played host to sentient indigenous species who violently resisted human encroachment, leading to bloody wars for supremacy. Yet the hardiest group of colonists not only endured, but thrived in their new environments. Using standard template construction technology, the pioneers were able to fabricate the structures and machines they needed to assert their dominance over their new planet. Each STC could replicate a specific creation repeatedly and without fail. In this way, the colonists built vast habitats to shield them from the ravages of their planet's atmosphere and devices to reconstitute life-giving essentials such as food, water, and breathable air. In many cases, the vessels that had transported the colonists through space were transformed into fortified enclaves that in time formed the basis for mighty fastnesses. This allowed for the creation of heavy mining tools refineries and processing plants with which the wealth of the new worlds could be rapidly exploited. STCs were used to create devastating machines capable of annihilating hostile races that offered resistance or invaded the burgeoning domains. The first night suits were both tools of settlement and weapons of war. Equally as capable of soaring down towering trees and crossing poor environments as they were of gunning down hostile Xenos. Only the most skilled and forceful individuals were equal to the task of operating the night suits, and it was to these warriors that the other colonists turned to for protection and, eventually, leadership. Long bloodlines of pilots emerged, and they were subtly mentally conditioned by the systems of their throne mechanicum to become ever more stringent and authoritarian. These were the nobles of the first knightly houses. The planets over which they ruled grew insular, rejecting new advancements in technology in favor of the traditions established and enforced by the nobles. Due to their isolationist cultures, the night worlds diverged from the path taken by the rest of humanity, and in doing so, were saved from the nightmares that followed. Consumed by strife. As rapidly as humanity expanded into the stars, 
the collapse of this galactic domain was even swifter. Vast distances between settled worlds led to the emergence of divergent cultures, and with these came rapid genetic evolution and mutation. Individuals emerged with the ability to sense and manipulate the tumultuous warp that existed parallel to real space. On some worlds, these psychers were mercilessly persecuted, being hunted down and slaughtered wherever they were found. But on many, they were revered and allowed to rule over their mundane kin. Alongside psychers came other subspecies of mankind, abhumans, whose genetic pool had been irrevocably tainted by the environments in which they dwelt. Interstellar wars broke out as the ideologies of neighboring systems grew ever more incompatible. Sentient machines turned violently on the masters they had been built to serve. Entire planets were overrun by Xenos armies, and as worlds burned, many of the wonders of the Age of Technologies were lost forever. With the seizing tumult came warp storms that tore through the void of space. Roots of contact between humanity's manifold domains were severed, leaving distant regions cut off from one another. The denizens were forced to face the horrors that befell them in isolation. The night worlds fared better than most in this time of terror and darkness. The noble houses had swiftly purged mutations that had developed amongst their subjects and had strangled branches of their own family trees where genetic deviance had appeared. From the first, they had rejected thinking machines, trusting instead to hard work and personal sacrifice to make their planet strong, and so were largely spared from the rampages of the men of iron. Armed with their night suits, they repelled Xenos incursions into their domains and crushed the savage mobs of mutated humans that came flooding in from nearby planets. The night houses fortified their holdings kept watch over their worlds and endured as the galaxy was overtaken by strife. Over long centuries, the cultures of these night worlds regressed even further. Superstitions about the enemies of old night became enshrined in codes of noble conduct. The technologies that allowed their colonists forebears to survive became worn, the knowledge of their functions lost. But the knights themselves survived, as did their traditions and the peoples whom they had sworn oaths to defend. The Coming of the Emperor When the Great Crusade spread out across the galaxy, a great number of night worlds were reunited with the rest of humanity. Vast fleets set out from Terra to find the remnants of mankind that were scattered amongst the stars, and to bring them under the aegis of the Emperor. Many of the worlds to which the Great Crusade came were ruled over by obstinate tyrants, warlords and despots who had risen to power during the anarchy of the Age of Strife, and who refused to humble themselves before the Emperor's might. These regimes were ended with brutal swiftness, crushed by the armies of the burgeoning Imperium. The first account of Night World being rediscovered came from a rogue trader called Named Jeffers. His reports to the Administratum noted both the formidable technology of the night suits as well as the loyalty and staunchness of the nobles who piloted them. In the years that followed, hundreds of other night worlds were encountered and brought into the fold. Most noble houses were quick to swear fealty to the leaders of the Great Crusade, for in the Imperium they saw their own values of order and duty implemented on an incomparably grand scale. Amongst the myriad organizations that made up the Great Crusade, it was the Mechanicum of Mars that was most successful in securing oaths of fealty from the Night Houses. The Martian tech priests coveted the ancient archaeotech that existed on these planets and were eager to exploit the rich mineral wealth of the various Night Worlds. Many noble families swore their service to the Mechanicum, though others gave their loyalty directly to Terra and the Emperor. Regardless of who they pledged themselves to, the knights loyally answered the call to war whenever it came. In return, the Sacristan orders who tended to the knights were inducted into the secrets of the Omnissiah, regaining many lost secrets of mechanical artifice 
that allowed them to better serve their masters. Dawn of Heresy The Great Crusade saw worlds across the length and breadth of the galaxy brought under the Emperor's mighty rule, but at its zenith, the Imperium was shattered by treachery. War Master Horus and fully half of the Space Marine Legions succumbed to the corruptions of the Dark Guards, and in the name of Chaos, launched an apocalyptic campaign against the Imperium. The galaxy was riven by civil war. The Illusionis Astartes slaughtered their erstwhile allies. Worlds were incinerated by teeming armies of heretics, and the light of hope carried by the Emperor was replaced by bitter darkness. It was during this time that the First Knights fell to chaos. Many amongst the Imperium have thought it impossible for the Night Houses to be corrupted. The Thrones Mechanicum to which they were bonded altered the noble psyche and synaptic makeup, conditioning them against harboring thoughts of betrayal or sedition. Indeed, the majority of the Night Worlds fought aggressively to stem the tide of heresy, putting down any rebellious elements within their own societies before joining in the battle against the Loyalist Space Marine Legions. Due to their sheer power and unflagging loyalty, the Knights were crucial to the Imperial War effort on countless bloody battlefields. Yet it was this same loyalty that led some to side with the enemy. Innumerable Mechanicum Forge worlds sided with Horus, as did many of the Night Houses that had sworn undying fealty to the tech priests of those worlds. As the Dark Mechanicum delved deeper into the arts of profane techno-sorcery, so too were the knights in their service, tainted by chaos. Ruin-marked knights marched to war alongside traitor Titan legions, unleashing devastation upon the defenders of the Imperium. Other fallen households upheld their oaths to Space Marine legions that turned traitor. The nobles of these houses followed their own codes of conduct to the letter, serving without question and answering all calls to war. And in doing so, place themselves on the path to damnation. Still other knights turned upon their own houses and renounced all ties to their bloodlines. Some were swayed by the whispering of malefic entities in their dreams, whereas others were bound to the will of the dark gods through sorcerous rituals. Thus were the Chaos Knights born, and in the hundred centuries since, they have continued to spread death and terror throughout the stars. The Path to Damnation Where each Loyalist Knight represents a long history of honour and self-sacrifice, the Chaos Knights come from a lineage of horror and depravity. Only through unspeakable atrocities and malefic rituals were these knightly lines able to be corrupted, and the tally of slaughter has only been added to since their fall. For noble to bond with their throne Mechanicum is a harrowing process. Only the most worthy individuals, men and women, possessed of formidable physical, mental and spiritual strength, are able to survive the ritual of becoming. Those who do are forever changed. In the fastness of each noble house, there is a sacred room known as the Chamber of Echoes. Within the Chamber of Echoes, the would-be pilot is wired into a throne mechanicum and left in isolation so their worth may be judged. Residing inside the throne mechanicum are the geist-like remnants of each of its former occupants. Every one of these electro spirits was once a noble, and it is they who assess the new supplicant's worth. Coursing through the neural sockets directly into the noble's mind, they are able to pry upon the supplicant's innermost thoughts and closely guarded secrets. The ritual lasts long and terrible hours, and those nobles who are found wanting are utterly consumed by the process. But those who are deemed worthy are bonded eternally with the throne mechanicum and with their forebears who dwell inside it. The ritual of becoming is not only the means by which a noble becomes a pilot, it is a necessary defense against corruption. A throne mechanicum is a shield to prevent the awesome power of a knight being wielded by one capable of treachery. From the moment they become, a pilot's thoughts are influenced by their throne even when they do not sit on it. 
Notions of fealty, obligation, and hierarchy are emblazoned at the forefront of the pilot's mind, as is a deep and undivided respect for the noble's ancestors and their household traditions. Such conditioning should make treachery impossible, but the will of the dark gods is strong, and their corruptions truly insidious. Iconoclast Houses The pilots of the first Iconoclast Houses had already become before the Horus Heresy. The enormity of the Imperium's fracturing had devastating effects on those knightly houses whose allegiances lay with the traitors. As a heretical war spread across the galaxy, the ghosts within hundreds of thrones Mechanicum howled in anguish. Their imprinted spirits tortured by the impossibility of upholding their honor in the face of their traitor master's deeds of betrayal whilst maintaining their loyalty. The neural outcry was such that some nobles were driven insane by it, while others suffered gruesome cranial hemorrhages. Others still followed blindly into damnation, claimed by that most insidious trap of believing honestly that those to whom they had sworn their oaths fought for a just cause. The vast majority of turncoat nobles, however, were subject to immense torments. They were ceaselessly assaulted by feelings of shame and hatred, their every negative emotion amplified and echoed by the ancestral spirits of their throne's mechanicum. According to the Code Chivalric, failure to perform one's duty is a transgression that can only be absolved through selfless service. As such, these knights fought all the harder for their treacherous lieges. At the commands of the heretical lords, Lances of Chaos Knights tore bloody paths through the Imperium's armies. Once honorable nobles led attacks to desecrate cities and enslave the populations of entire planets. Miles high statues dedicated to the Emperor were toppled by night's ceaseless bombardments, and in their place, profane monuments were erected to glorify the cruelties of the Dark Gods. These attempts to quell their self loathing through unquestioning service only added further fuel to the fire. The knights were compelled towards greater extremes of brutality and further depths of depravity, and with every debased action, the screams of their throne mechanicum grew louder. Over time, the Chaos Knights became unrecognizable as the valiant warriors they once were. Some had transformed into incarnations of carnage. They hacked their way through the steel and flesh of their foes, seeking only to drown their unrelenting anguish in oceans of blood. Others became agents of instability. Their motivations and allegiances upended constantly by the hateful tempests that raged in their souls. The insanity that festered inside each Chaos Knight corroded their notions of chivalry, twisting concepts of honor and duty into new and nightmarish ideals. These fallen nobles justified the most heinous atrocities they committed, reasoning that they had been bred to be exemplars of virtue, so every action they took must therefore be virtuous. Whilst incinerating the defenders of an imperial bastion, a knight would conclude that such measures must be necessary, for otherwise their codes of virtue would not allow them to immolate their victims. By the same grotesque logic, if roasting alive a hundred Imperial soldiers was an act of honor, then there could be no greater honor than seeing the entire galaxy set ablaze. The tortures endured by each Chaos Knight pilot served to permanently corrupt their throne Mechanicum. Upon their death, the imprinted remnants of a fallen noble remained in their throne, where their twisted visions of virtue spread to other spectral echoes like a rampant infection. No longer would the throne serve to shield the pilot from corruption. It now fed the depraved desires of those who would bond with it. Bloodlust, sadism, and psychosis were fostered in the lines of the fallen nobles that flowed from the first Chaos Knights, giving rise to the tyrannical warlords of the early Arcanoclast Houses. Infernal Houses not all knights fell to chaos in the same manner as those of the iconoclast houses. Those whose pilot had sworn allegiance to the heretics of the Dark Mechanicum were the subject of countless dread rituals, each designed to corrupt the supposedly incorruptible technologies of the Throne Mechanicum. 
The true knowledge of how the thrones functioned was beyond the ken of even the most ancient Magi, but the colossal military potential of the knights spurred them to conduct ever more depraved experiments. On hellish forge worlds, dark Magi created their own grim simulcra of the Chamber of Echoes, and into these screaming oubliettes they dragged the thrones mechanicum from captured knight suits, often with the broken and bloody pilot still attached. Many of these chambers were lined with arcane devices that were used to bombard the captive thrones with focused warp energy. Others bristled with mechadendritic tentacles, parasitically fused themselves to the throne, and through them, demonic entities were able to surge into the host tissue of the neural riot pilot. Certain sects of the Dark Mechanicum raised up base warrior champions who fought one another for the right to become. These individuals were not trained in the ways of the noble houses, but for them, the prospect of piloting a knight blinded them to the dangers of attempting to become. The results of these procedures were ubiquitously gruesome. But amidst the tortured cries, the explosions of flesh and the scrap code howls of the tainted thrones, the Magi of the Dark Mechanicum gleaned volumes of morbid data. Arcane procedures were devised to scramble the geists that dwelled within each throne. Spectrophagic demons were summoned to devour the spirit echoes of pilots past. The thrones mechanicum and the knight suits themselves were seeded with pathogenic scrap code, and in some rare cases the Magi used their technologies to open interstitial warp rifts inside the ancient circuitry clusters. Though only a fraction of the knight suits and thrones that were captured survived these torturous experiments, those that did were corrupted beyond redemption, as were any pilots unfortunate enough to survive. Through unspeakable procedures, the Dark Mechanicum bonded these fallen knights to their tainted war engines, thus creating the progenitors of the Infernal Houses. Chaos Knight Worlds as the night houses became ever more corrupted, so too were their worlds transformed into horrific mockeries of their former glory. Where once the denizens of these planets had looked to their nobles for leadership and protection, they were swiftly reduced to a terror-filled existence. The populations of entire cities were hunted for sport by their nightly overlords. Fallen nobles supplied tithes of living humans to their heretical leaders to be used in sadistic rituals or the forging of demonic pacts. Where once the would-be night pilot prepared for their duty over years of training and proved their worth in solemn duels, they now engaged in competitive slaughters of their own subjects. Depraved cultures took root in every echelon of society on these chaos night worlds. Teeming cults worshipped the dark gods openly fallen nobles competing to raise the greatest fanes to the ruinous powers. The landscapes became pocked with charnel pits that overflowed with the corpses of defeated enemies. These planets that had been bastions of order throughout the Age of Strife metamorphosed into deep wells of anarchy, from which the tate of chaos seeped further into reality. Endless Damnation Knights have continued to fall to chaos, in the millennia since the Horus Heresy. Night worlds laying on the edges of raging, empiric storms have been inexorably transformed by the outflow of the raw warp energy. On more than one occasion, such a planet has been enveloped entirely by a nightmarish tempest, only to later re-emerge, its population devoured by demons and its war engines hideously transfigured. Other knights have solely succumbed to corruption over the long campaigns they have fought on the side of the Imperium, after butchering endless tides of frenzied heretics for centuries without rest, the pursuit of carnage can become synonymous with duty. This is especially true for those knights fighting in isolation from their household kin, or in war zones where reality is distorted by the dread influence of chaos. Caked in the blood of a thousand conflicts and faced with horror in every direction, the mechanized warriors lose the ability to differentiate between ally and enemy. Even the spectral gestalt of their throne mechanicum becomes blinded by the need to kill, not caring who or what is the focus of the knight's destructive fury. 
Several knights thought lost in battle have later been discovered to have fallen and to have continued their slaughters unabated. Engines of Ruin It is not only the pilots, but the night suits themselves that are warped by chaos. Demonic energy is coursed through the weapon systems and ancient circuitry of these dead war machines, and their tortured machine spirits growl like wounded beasts. Over time, even the armored plates and bristling armaments of the Chaos Knight are mutated beyond recognition. Chaos corruption seeded into a throne mechanicum spreads into the rest of the night like a rot. Machine spirits that drive the night's massive actuators are bent to the insane will of the pilot and the spectral inhabitants of the throne. No longer does the war engine march with bold and purposeful strides, its every colossal movement the result of generations of discipline and training within the noble houses. Instead, the Chaos Knight lopes forward with predatory haste, eager to drink in the deaths of its next band of foes. Gone is the imperative desire to protect its allies, to form the immovable center of a defensive line, or the unstoppable spear tip of a combined charge. The Chaos Knight's machine spirit cares nothing for those alongside whom it fights. Whether they live or die is of little concern, so long as it can engage in rampant slaughter. Ancient mechanical joints that have been ritually oiled for scores of centuries now spark and crackle as they are driven into motion. Plasma cores roar with fury as they are fired into overdrive to spy the Chaos Knights with the immense power they need to loose their wrath. Gouts of scintillating flame burst from exhaust points, scorching the surrounding metal with their jagged tongues and warping the very air around the knight's immense carapaces. As the Chaos Knights advance, they tilt their iron shields to the fore, the better to ward off the enemy's incoming fire before they charge headlong into the fray. Gone are concerns of strategic forethought or target prioritization, and in their place, is a predatory desire to wreak indiscriminate slaughter, to torment those too weak to fight, or to claim the most magnificent trophy from the enemy in the name of personal glory. If a loyalist knight is akin to its noble's valiant steed, Chaos Knights are closer to rabid warhounds. Their fallen pilots fighting constantly to retain dominance over their hate-filled war engines and forced to obey their will. Drooling blood or acidic oils Ocular lenses burning with murder lust, and hulls wreathed in miasmal fumes or crackling hellfires. It is clear to all who look upon Chaos Knights that whatever nobility resided within these deranged war engines, it has long soured into hate and madness. Some bodies within the Imperium stringently resist the notion that Chaos Knights could possibly exist and more than one internecine doctrinal conflict has erupted upon Forge Worlds whose tech magi found themselves divided on this point. Regardless of such willful self-delusion, the Ordo Hereticus has produced grimoires in which war engines have been declared Quaestor Tractoris and subsequently redesignated. In part, this is necessary because fallen noble houses soon abandoned the age-old doctrines of armament obeyed by loyalist houses choosing instead to arm their knights with whatever combinations of weaponry best suit their preferred methods of murder. Chaos-tainted armagers are known as war dogs. The lightest walkers of the fallen houses, they are also the most wanton in their savagery. They seek out unprotected flanks and isolated enemies and crush whatever resistance can be brought to bear against them. Questorless class knights are reclassified as knights despoiler making up the bulk of many iconoclast and infernal houses, their thick armor and punishing arrays of weaponry allow them to wreak untold havoc on any battlefield. Often, it is the pilot of a knight despoiler who reigns as the despot of a fallen house, directing the household's murderous campaigns and charging at the head of each brutal assault. Corrupted Dominus cast knights are designated as knights tyrant, and it is these who are most likely to have fallen to chaos in the throes of endless combat. Practically titan cast in size and resilience, it is the task of entire armies to fell such a towering engine of destruction. The longer a chaos knight has been corrupted, 
the more physically warped it becomes. Internal mechanisms burst throughout its outer carapace, winding together to form rows of irregular spikes. Gun muzzles sprout teeth and gauntleted fists curl into cruel claws. In extreme cases, the structure of the towering machine contorts into new configurations, legs bending backwards on mutated joints, vox grills splitting into a snarling maw. Known as abhorrent class knights, these deformed engines are nightmares of metal and flesh. They lope hungrily towards wherever the fighting is thickest, annihilating all before them with streams of gunfire and brutal swings of their close quarters armaments. So twisted are abhorrent class knights, both in form and spirit. Certain old O'Hereticus Inquisitors have speculated they may have been created from STC machines corrupted by the Dark Mechanicum. As grotesque as the exterior of a Chaos Knight becomes, the cockpit where the pilot sits enthroned is even more horrific. In many nights, the fallen noble is fused bodily with the throne, their flesh melding with the surrounding metal, their neurons parasitized by manifold dendritic relays. As a mechanical suit around them absorbs ever more corrupting energy, the pilot is physically warped into a being of pure chaos. Some are absorbed completely by their throne. Their body peels open like a rotten carcass, forming a cage of splayed ribs and exposed organs inside which the next pilot can be seated. Over multiple generations, such thrones take on the appearance of a morbid rose, with layer upon layer of flesh fronds sprouting from them, each with a dim portion of sentience remaining. Other pilots devolve into chaos spawn while atop their thrones. Transformed into amorphous beasts comprised of muscle and bone, they thrash in a state of abject insanity. Yet a portion of their consciousness remains held within the throne, allowing them to still control their night suit and experience the true horror of their existence. Idolaters to maintain the integrity of their Chaos Knight suits over the course of countless brutal wars, fallen nobles rely on the artisans known as idolaters. Like those whom they serve, idolaters are an aberrant offshoot of peoples loyal to the Imperium. Where the Sanchristan orders are trained by the Adeptus Mechanicus, inducted into the holy mysteries of the Omnissiah, so that they might minister to the Knights of the Noble Houses, Idolaters learn their craft within the screaming soul forges of the Dark Mechanicum. Through diabolic rituals, they entreat the entities that dwell within the warp, sacrificing living victims and mighty machines on great cog-shaped altars. Through such practices, they glean knowledge of how Chaos Knights function and, more importantly, they learn how to desecrate the ostensibly incorruptible technologies of the Throne's Mechanicum. Oftentimes, there will be multiple cabals of idolaters dwelling on each Chaos Knight world, each with the ability to repair battle damage sustained by the mechanical suits. The power of these cabals waxes and wanes with the service that they can provide to the fallen household. Some know the secrets to performing mecha-inductive rituals that will vastly augment her prominent knight's power. Others may be able to subjugate their liege noble's rivals through the installation of psychic yokes and spiritual shackles. Then there are those idolaters who have learnt the sorcerous ways of the warp and can provide glimpses of the future so that a knight despot can better direct their next campaign of terror. Competition between cabals is encouraged by the nobility and it is common for wars to break out amongst opposing groups of idolaters. Should a cabal fall out of favor with the nobles they serve, their flayed corpses may be used to decorate the fallen household's night suits. However, such actions are not taken lightly, for to incur the ire of the idolaters is to invite a nightmarish demise. Many a fallen noble who has slaughtered an idolater has subsequently been devoured by their own night suit, or has had their soul ripped to screaming pieces by a warp surge within their throne mechanicum. The most cunning nobles therefore ensure that the idolaters in their service have some other target upon whom such malice is likely to fall. A. 
End quote. But what does any of this mean? It means an escalation of war to a time none wish they could return to. It means that the night houses of darkness are now abroad. They walk the planets of the Imperium as once they did. But now they are parodies and equals yet opposites of their previous shining splendor. The demon Primarchs are on the move, and when they deign to reveal themselves openly, they will summon their legions again, as Magnus has, and ever at their side, under thrall of fury and honor, or paid in a billion lives, they will bring the Chaos Knights with them. More maneuverable than a Titan, hard to hit, hard to target, yet able to expel firepower that can level buildings, smash tanks as if they were made of paper. With shields that are proof to all but another of their kind, the Chaos Knights are a tactically strategic and almost extinction-level threat to most worlds. Even, perhaps, to those who are home to a chapter of Space Marines. They are ruthless, bloodthirsty, and ready. They will march alongside the Dark Mechanicum and their masters in the Legions, and they will bring all of the wrath of hell with them. I have been Baltimore, your faithful servant. Now please do not worry. This was merely an overview of the Chaos Knights. We shall get into their phenomenal weaponry, defenses, activity, makes, models, and orders in the near future. If you have enjoyed this video, then do consider liking and subscribing. And of course, do check out our other channel, GK Natural History. And of course, there is a link to a Discord. Thank you for listening. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Toodaloo!